politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. With a looming fight on Capitol Hill over the debt ceiling today, we are going to be in conversation about the origins of austerity. My guest or argues that this or austerity really begins in the way that we understand it in the early 20th century. My, glass, my guest is Clara E. Mate. Clara Mate is Assistant Professor of Economics at the New School for Social Research in New York City, and she is the author of the book that she joins us to talk about called The Capital Order, How Economists Invented Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism. Clara Mate, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this program. It's fantastic to be here. Your story really begins in the early 20th century, the time of World War One, in, w- in which you say that capitalism was at it was in an extreme crisis. What's happening with the economic system of capitalism during the time of World War One? Right. So the um, the Capital Order is a book that uses a historical lens, or better, historical political economy, to be able to understand the logic of what is still happening today. So in order to understand why we cannot dismiss austerity merely as a policy mistake, if we want to be critical of it, but we need to understand that austerity is actually quite intelligent in being able to protect the foundations of our society, meaning the fact that we are all accepting our conditions as low paid wage workers. Well, we need to bring it back to a century ago, exactly to what happened after the Great War. So in 1918, between 1918 and 1920, those were the years called the red years, years of um, opening up of a spectrum of post-capitalist alternatives that had emerged thanks to the fact that with the Great War, the state had intervened massively as main producer and main distributor and especially main employer. Um, So it had basically breached its natural boundaries, natural in quotes, boundaries of action and repoliticized the market. Meaning that people started realizing that actually wage relations and private property of the means of production, which are kind of the basis of our society still today, were not givens, facts that we should just accept, but they were the outcome of explicit political decisions of the state to preserve them. So it is in this moment that we see that uh, there is an opening up of imagination and a very practical engagement in alternatives to capitalism that were really interesting. And I think that's why the first part of the Capital Order, my book, focuses on going into the details of the of the moment by looking at the archives, the newspapers of the time to really give you a lively idea of what councils were about, workers' councils, peasants' councils, what guilds were about, what the idea of nationalizing uh, main energy systems and the self-management of workers combined with it was about, what the birth of the welfare state was about, a variety of from more radical to less radical alternatives that though were in a way shaking the status quo. And it's in this moment, I argue, that austerity emerges as a militant response to this disorder uh, of capitalism in order to tell people, you know what, you're wrong. There's no way out of here. We just need to accept the system as it is. We need to sacrifice the motto coined in 1919 at Brussels, the first international financial conference was produce more, consume less. The motto was live hard, save hard. Uh, I know I forgot the third one and work hard. So this was the idea, right? The idea was that uh, the only reason why the only reason to get out of an economic crisis is for people to realize they have lived beyond their means they're demanding too much and now they have to just accept to get back to what is the class appropriate behavior of the workers which is again to produce more efficiently and to consume less and to conclude i would like to say that this type of language about the collective sacrifice that's really the sacrifice then on the workers and the fact that you know this is the only way out and the experts knows the good of the whole these are all themes 
that as uh, Americans, unfortunately, we've gotten quite used to. I'm going to come back to these conferences that you mentioned in a moment, but this is a really important point and something I think we can relate to today. In World War I, governments began spending and doing things that were extraordinary for, for the times and even intervening in their own economies uh, at the time. In some ways, I, I guess people are experiencing early in World War I and then wanted more from this. I'll let you explain. But in some ways, maybe they were astounded the way I, I remember I felt at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, when the, you know when there was a moratorium on evictions, when people started getting stimulus checks, when uh, there was extra money for having for for each child that you had, uh, food stamps, uh, all these things are now going away. Uh, regardless of this debt ceiling issue, uh, they're going away anyways. But I, there was this moment of like, oh wow, look, look what government can actually do. We even saw in our time uh, with the pandemic, poverty decrease. Um, I, I suspect this is a very, and I think what you're arguing here is this is a very similar dynamic that happens 100 years ago. Absolutely. What is fascinating is the direct parallelism with uh, the what happened 100 years ago and what is happening now. Now, of course, the level of government intervention during the First World War, given that it was a matter of life or death with with respect to other countries, um, right? So the point is that the, the 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 European states were about were risking to lose against other states, so they did really did whatever it took. Um, was a much more vigorous uh, state intervention than what we saw with the COVID pandemic, especially the nationalization of main industries was something that uh, we did not see at our time. But certainly the distributive measures which were measures ultimately of social appeasement to avoid the continuing of riots. We can say that we saw a breakout actually during the pandemic uh, to avoid at the time having people renounce um, participating in the war effort. You had to redistribute something to the people. And this became very obvious to the bureaucrats. And it's something that, again, we saw. Now, what is important to note is that for a capitalist economy to run smoothly, there are precise limits to what the capitalist state can do. Why? Well, because as soon as the limits are a little bit tweaked, um, we see that, again, people start realizing that the economy is not an, an object that is immutable, but they can actually have a say and potentially change the way they live, right? So what is fascinating is that there, for many, the reason why Americans right now have left the workforce, the great resignation with 46 million Americans leaving their jobs just in 2022, with similar numbers in 2021, with the labor market becoming tight, with the big scare from the part of the experts in power that the labor market is not working because people are just not willing anymore to accept a harsh life of precarious and low paid labor because they saw that there were all these alternatives. And we know that actually uh, the Trump and the Biden administration gave really crumbs to workers and to citizens with respect to what they gave to um, the big uh, bailouts and supports of, of big business. But at the same time, these crumbs were enough to open up imaginations of the fact that maybe wage relations could be overcome by something different. And it is really interesting because in 1919, 1920, of course, there were really uh, efforts to uh, imagine democratic production of resources. And there was organized labor was very strong. Unionization was growing, especially in the manufacturing sector. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that right now we are experiencing with the post-COVID moment, a, a surge in unionization also in the United States, especially in the services who have been historically the services with the sector of the economy where the wages were lowest. Um, so the increases in nominal wages that were are again a threat for economists have been real, especially in um for the marginalized groups um so the weakest of all of us were gaining out of this um tight labor market that followed the fact that many were just not willing to accept their condition of wage workers so it is here that you realize that what we see the striking back of austerity through deflation right the fed increasing the interest rates 
That's also and austerity because we usually think of it. That is also austerity. So mm -hmm. That is really, really important. Um, it's part of the story I tell is that we shouldn't reduce austerity to just cuts in the budget. We should understand austerity as a trinity in which dear money is a big austerity policy. And we see it exactly now striking back in order to protect the labor market, to make sure that people will go back to work. What do you do? Well, you increase the interest rates so that the bargaining power of the workers is diminished. The disciplinary mechanism is the increase in unemployment. And this is something that economists understand clearly is to make the workforce more vulnerable, you have to increase the competition amongst workers, and this you do if there's less jobs. So what happens is that interest rate hikes, as we are noticing in the last months, are reducing the number of new jobs available. They are actually already setting in motion layoffs, and this is going to allow um, to bring down the nominal wage increases that were actually improving for the workers. So we see that it will be a mechanism to repress wages. So this is really important to understand that austerity is a crucial political mechanism to tell people you can't have a better life. And this is just what is necessary for monetary stability. And of course, this is not is a necessity, which is a political necessity of reinforcing the hierarchical relations in our society. So this is monetary austerity that goes together with fiscal austerity, of course, and fiscal austerity takes the form of cuts, especially in the social expenditures. So let's not be fooled. The fact that the United States right now is spending so much money on the war effort, right? So much money in Ukraine. This doesn't mean there's no austerity. You need to go and check where the money is being spent. And what you see is that it's being spent to boost the military industrial complex to the detriment of all the social benefits uh, that we, we know of. In New York right now, they're cutting money on lawyers, public lawyers who should help out people that are being evicted because they can't afford rent. This is part of the fact that there is money, but it's being spent on certain elites and not on the majority. That is austerity including then to continue regressive taxation is a huge austerity measure, meaning that taxes go up for us all through consumption tax increases, while there is an allergy, a, a, a national allergy about taxing, of course, wealth to the point that corporate taxes have decreased massively in the last century. And so have the uh, highest interest, sorry, highest um, um Tax brackets have gone down. It was 90% during Eisenhower's time, and now we are um, at a much lower level. Now we are reduced to a 37% as of 2021. Yeah, when it was when it was 91% during the, the years of the Eisenhower presidency. Um coming back to 19 the coming back to the years just following World War One, you chronicle both England and and Italy, and this is fascinating because England would adopt a liberal economic system. Italy would adopt a fascist economic system. Uh, I want to talk about both of these. Begin with England's interesting. The years following, you'd have what, what you call Reconstruction. Um, and what, is this the birth of the welfare state? Right. So um, the book, uh, The Capital Order, um, uses a historical comparative lens um, to present a very thought-provoking message, which is that if we take the lens of austerity, and again, see austerity as this trinity, and moreover as the type of economic theory that backs and justifies this th trinity, and this trinity, all that it does is really shift resources once more from the majority of people making money out of wages to the minority that makes their income out of interest and dividends. This austerity is 
crucial to understand that unfortunately between liberal parliamentary democracies and historically fascist states like the state of Benito Mussolini in Italy who came to power in 1922 who is considered the founder of fascism uh, it's actually the original uh, fascist dictatorship well unfortunately what the capital order highlights is that the treatment that the British Treasury and the uh, Bank of England in Britain were imposing on their citizens through interest rate hikes, curtailment of social expenditures and privatizations, which is again austerity, was very similar to what Mussolini was doing in the 1920s in, in Italy. So what you see is actually that in both countries, the priority was to safeguard the capital order, once more safeguard the foundation of our capitalist economy and the wage relations. And this meant whatever it takes. In a country like Italy, you would do it, you would need the strong state, strong hand of Mussolini's fascist state because the Italians were considered at the time too restless. We were actually, um, workers had occupied and were running on their own the majority of the factories in the whole peninsula. And in this moment, actually, the liberals were the first one to say, we got to have Mussolini in power to stop this all. So the backing that Mussolini got from the international and national uh, liberal financial uh, elite and liberal uh, is incredible because they understood quite well that in order to preserve the foundation of capitalism, he was the only one who was willing to enforce brutal austerity on the population and could do it because political repression was real, people were being killed and murdered if they did not accept austerity as the only way forward. But, but tell me so about what you the, see. I, 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 I do want to know about these expansions, though, the expansions before sort of the austerity. Right, that's what I was getting at. Right, exactly. So this is, um, these are all, again, um, countermeasures to what was happening immediately before. Because in uh, with the end of the First World War, the Ministry of Reconstruction in Great Britain, uh, founded in 1917 and very, very active in 1918 and 1918, 1919, the Ministry of Reconstruction was envisaging a new birth for uh, the British economy and in general from the for the European economy at large. And the words at the time were words of, there's no way we're going to go back to the old ways. We are here to see a new future. This what is saying. That's what we were saying with COVID, the early years of COVID. Right. And so this is, for example, the British civil servant, Alfred D. Hall. He says, for no one, this he was writing 1919, for no one can doubt that we are at a turning point in our national history. A new year has come upon us. We cannot stand still. We cannot return to the old ways, the old abuses, the old stupidities. The public not only has its conscience aroused and its heart stirred, but also has in mind open and reception of new ideas to an unprecedented degree. And again, these new ideas were matched by new institutions. Um, in Britain, of course, uh, the birth of the welfare state really um, really, really sophisticated plans to uh, promote adult education, to promote uh, communal housing that would allow women to actually uh, um, read and take care of kids in, in, in to get so as to have more free time. Um, cases of really urban planning in which you would build libraries, spaces to dance, you know, commun um, areas. All this was a great future that was being envisaged, and it was completely smashed by the austerity that took over just in 1921, right? So when the Bank of England started increases, increasing interest rate in the spring of 1920, it became much more difficult for local 
uh, governments to borrow, what we still we st see now, for g local governments to borrow now becomes more difficult. And this meant slowly the uh, withering away of all of these promises of social be betterment. And this was happening in Britain, but it was also happening in Italy, where we had seen similar um, cases of um, overcoming the hardship of, let's say, fair capitalism in favor of economic democracy, which was lambed shut by Mussolini's fascist dictatorship, supported by economists, uh, mainstream economists, and especially by the liberal establishment in the whole rest of the West. This is Letters on Politics, and we are in conversation with Clara Matai. Clara Matai is assistant professor of economics at the New School for Social Research in New York City, and she is the author of the book, The Capital Order, How Economists Invented Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism. Let, let's look a little more at, at Italy, which, which seems in the, in the early years after the war even took a harder, more radical turn uh, than even than in England. Uh, Antonio Gramsci is an important figure in the story you tell in his newspaper. Who, who was Antonio Gramsci? Antonio Gramsci is still um, a very, very famous name. Uh, he um, was a Marxian intellectual, but he was not just an intellectual. He was also uh, participating actively in the experiments of the workers' councils during and immediately after the First World War. So uh, Antonio Gramsci became the leader of L'Ordine Nuovo. He founded what is translatable as the New Order, which was a magazine. And the idea of this magazine is that it was tracing directly what was happening at the level of the workplace. So the big intuition of Antonio Gramsci, who we all remember for his prison notebooks, which he wrote when he was in jail, imprisoned by uh, Benito Mussolini in, 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 nine, in, the, in the later 1920s, he actually wrote those prison notebooks uh, thanks to his experience, which was a practical direct experience uh, in the councils. So this is one big intuition of the Gramscian philosophy is that you can only think in an, in an emancipated way if you participate in emancipatory institutions. In other words, thought and action go hand in hand and reinforce one another. So you could only really be able to escape the trap of the bourgeois ideology that tells us that there's no other world possible except for the capitalist system if we participate in actual democratic decision-making processes that can start very small in the workshop, in the council, in the countryside at the time, uh, peasants actually getting together and self-managing the land. So in this sense, Antonio Gramsci, I think, is a very important character of my book uh, because he was the real enemy of the austerity economist because he was debunking the worldview that had trapped the workers until that moment, which told them that knowledge could only come from the select few, the people writing at their desks in their ivory tower, and that everyone else should just accept the dogmas of the laws of the market as a fact that they are too stupid to understand. So in this sense, Gramsci was really empowering by telling people, no, you can participate in knowledge building in understanding how the economy works. You can really figure out that actually the source of value in a capitalist economy is the worker himself, the producers, the class of those who actually are exploited are those that are the engine of our economy and thus should take back their own centrality and take back their own activity and gain uh, a future with which is a democratic future. This is something that I think is still very inspiring for us today, especially in a moment in which economists, um, mainstream economists, 
in universities, in the monetary and fiscal institutions, tend to use models that instead say, no, workers are only secondary inputs. What really matters are those who are able to save capital. And thus, we should incentivize those select few. And if this is the model, you clearly understand that austerity is the only solution because austerity is indeed a set of policies that incentivize the few that shift resources towards those who the models tell us are those who should benefit because they are actually doing the good for everyone else as well. The Gramsci framework tells us, no, there is class conflict, there is struggle, there is no harmony under capitalism. And if the workers want to have a voice, they need to participate and realize that the models that bourgeois economists impose on us are models that are political and they are there to disempower. Let's talk more about these models again after the the, the creation really of a, of a welfare state in, in Great Britain and then just really a radical turn in Italy, as you were saying, with the creation of uh, worker councils and sort of just running their, their own businesses uh, and how this spread. You, you do get a backlash to this. And the, there's two important international financial conferences. You referenced them earlier, but I do think they're important to dive into some more. That first one is in Brussels in 1919 and then in Genoa in 1922. What's important to know about these conferences? These conferences are conferences that really set uh, the tone for the construction of austerity as this powerful tool to foreclose all of these alternatives to capitalism and to once more really um, trap our minds into thinking that this is it. This is all we can get. This is the best we can do. And actually, um, I can read you um, some quotes to give you a sense of the type of language that was coined at the time, which is a language that, that unfortunately we are really familiar with. And here, though, you can really have a, get a sense of the sense of encirclement that the economists were dreading. They felt that people were not listening to them anymore and they were worried about their loss of authority. So um, R.H. Brand, for example, is a financier and he was talking of this historical paradox. He says it is a paradox of the situation that urgent as is this limitation of expenditure on financial and economic grounds. The whole force of public opinion still seems to be exerted in the opposite direction. The war has led to an almost universal demand for the extension of government function. Workers were encouraged to expect and do expect some new way of life, some greater betterment of their lot. They do not realize the hard truth that a better life can be now reached only through labor and suffering. So again, this hard truth that is work hard, live hard, save hard, which is coined at the time, is a way to tell people it's only the expert who knows the science, who is able to understand the viable way forward. And we can tell you that you guys have just lived ab above your means and this is completely unacceptable and it's interesting because this is happening in a moment in which many other economists had actually understood the power of economic planning and the power of actual political management of economic resources that was a even more efficient than um, the market itself, right? This is the very reason why the state had to intervene during the war to manage the economy was that if it was left to the invisible hand of the market, um, they, Britain, for example, would have lost the war because actually the profit motive was going against the, mo the needs of society at that time right so the typical example is this example of the shipping industry in which um ships were being were being sold to the enemy to the point that really britain was not capable of fighting back and thus they had to nationalize shipping and uh, nationalize the production of ships now 
I think this speaks a lot to us still today, because if we think about the crisis of the climate catastrophe that is looming, um, I think there's many people that are realizing slowly that the short term vision of production for profit in the hands of private entities is not really fit to confront the existential catastrophe that we need to resolve quickly. So some in it is in these moments in which people are realizing that actually the market is not efficient and especially is not just. It's not a system that allows for the betterment of people's life, but it's actually a system that presupposes and requires the sacrifice of the working classes. Well, it is in this moment that the words of economic truth, sacrifice, um, neutrality of the expert, the um, these are the moments in which the weapon of the hard science is used to try to like have people um, kind of lose faith in a possibility of running things differently. Here in the United States, again, where where the our Congress is dealing with the issue of debt limit again your 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 book focuses on england and italy in the years after world war one uh our debt limit actually comes from world war one our debt the, the ceiling that we have comes from world war one and, and what b before world war one congress had to approve almost every spending measure the idea was well in the time of war we can't necessarily do that so we're going to give the executive branch more authority to be able to spend money on the war but we're going to cap it we're going to cap how much uh they can do it and that's where the debt ceiling comes from and it's something we've had uh, ever since do you, do you see any significance in that and in, 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 in any parallels and and how we get our debt ceiling to what was happening in the early 20th century so, well, um, in the United States, I don't focus on the United States um, as a um, as a country, unfortunately, but it's clearly an actor in the background. And what you uh, see, if you um, take a look at certain uh, some literature, for example, a very good book called uh, The United States and Fascist Italy of Gian Giacomo Migone, he really shows how also in the United States you had seen a similar trend in the sense that indeed uh, the war effort had meant having to really breach the idea that there is such thing as a natural limit to economic resources. It became clear that actually the state had the power to um, find resources when it was necessary that borrowing was a possibility, that um, printing money was a possibility. And this whole understanding of monetary expansion had triggered also greater demands from the part of organized labor in demanding more and actually in demanding potentially just really an overcoming of the traditional limits of laissez-faire capitalism. So um, in the sense we see that, again, the reaction in the 1920s also in the United States has been a, a reaction of deflation and a reaction of austerity in which, once more, you need to construct institutions that set limits um, and set constraints. And these, again, are political choices because the idea that there is such a powerful possibility of deciding collectively how to use the resources. This was really, really terrifying to those in power and to those who are gaining from a system in which actually you pretended there is a natural limit. And in this way, you do keep the resources for the very, very few. You, you write that austerity is meant to protect capitalism. Tell me about that. Yes, uh, in, in two words, this is the thesis. And again, I use the historical case study to really show how this is indeed the fact. Austerity protects capitalism uh, because once more it protects, sorry, it protects the basic social relation that makes up our capitalist economy, which is once more the fact that the majority of us have no other alternative but to go sell one's capacity to work in return for wage and especially a low wage. So this uh, capital as the social relation, given that it is not a fixed 
natural fact, but it's the outcome of a very young economic system. Capitalism has been on Earth only for 0.1% of the time Homo sapiens has been on the planet. So it's a very young economic system. And the social relation that grounds it is not permanent, but needs to be constantly protected, especially protected from the possibilities of people realizing that we could have a different and better world. So this capital as the social relation requires some guardians and uh, mainstream economists uh, came together to indeed construct the best guardian of capitalism, which is austerity. And again, because it works to shift resources away from the people, make people unemployed, privatize, increase the competition of the workers in the economy. This disempowers us. This makes it such that we have to spend all our day working and being worried about making a living. And this takes away resources and spaces for actually discussing, talking, coming together, mobilizing. So, you know, sure, people protest austerity, but these are very defensive protests. The offense, the idea of actually thinking of a better world, that is blocked by the very material compulsion, the coercive effects of austerity upon our lives. And again, also, unfortunately, upon our minds, uh, thanks to these economic models that justify austerity as the policies that that are ultimately mirroring the the meritocracy in our society, this false idea that those at the top deserve it, uh, is also part of the austerity doctrine that I look at uh, from its origins in the 1920s. So if austerity is meant to protect capitalism, does that mean that the welfare state is a threat to capitalism? That's a very good uh, point. So I would say that unfortunately uh, for how our economic system works, there is a very limited space for the welfare state that is not a welfare state that is not going to be politically challenging uh, for the capital order. Because the welfare so, state, the, wel the welfare state also protects capitalism, right? I mean, yes. this is what John Maynard Keynes argued. Absolutely. This is a very important point. So, of course, the welfare state um, has a role to play, uh, but it has precise boundaries if it doesn't want to risk shaking it up and uh, having people try to break away from the system in general. So why do I say this? Because, for example, John Maynard Keynes, who we associate with the welfare state, was someone that was very, very wary of um, the inflationary um, troubles that would come with expanding the welfare state in moment in, of economic growth. To the point that in my book, uh, The Capital Order, Keynes is one of the protagonists. And in 1919, it's very interesting to see that Keynes was not for expansion at all. He was actually for austerity. So um, Keynes comes up with the idea of the welfare state in a moment in which there's an economic downturn. This economic downturn, though, is not threatening to the political stability of the system in the sense that the workers are very weak. An economic downturn is a moment in which the unemployment rates are very high and in which anyone is desperate to get a job and is willing to get a job at also a very, very um, low low level. So here is when the welfare state protects capitalism in the sense that, that it is required in order to um, basically avoid people from starving. But uh, so as so there is a role for the welfare state, but it's an, and it's a role that, of course, has been important historically. The very fact that people are capable of going to work the next day is something that has to do a lot with the state ultimately um, taking in the costs of the reproduction of the labor force that is um, a cost that otherwise the private employers would have to pay for, right? That's kind of like seeing, that's almost seen in welfare as actually uh, subsidizing capitalism or capital right. this, corporations. This is a, yes, this is a way uh, you could look at, um, you can look at it. So, of course, uh, 
there's many cases, and I'm sure um, the uh, listeners know them, for example, about Walmart actually uh, being able to pay their workers so little because these workers are ultimately like surviving off of public benefits. And uh, and this is basically the fact that there's so many workers in the, the most successful corporations in the world that actually make it thanks to this uh, public benefits is something that uh, is not an exception. It is the rule in our society. So for sure, the state is taking in the costs that were otherwise be costs that the public employee would have to face. However, again, the reason why right now they're thinking about making food stamps conditional on work working is really something that I think should get us thinking because there are limits. If the state started giving money as the, it did during COVID to people just for as a right, as a matter of being a citizen, um, this would really, really be threatening to the foundation of our society, which is with the wage relation, the fact that people are forced to go and work for a wage. So you see here that it is a thin line between supporting the reproduction of labor, but doing it in a way that doesn't risk getting people to think that actually the state has the power to organize society in a way that is not capitalist. And of course, in that point, we wouldn't be in a capitalist state anymore. We would be thinking about the whole wholly different society based on wholly different principles. And again, this doesn't require a bloody revolution. This is actually something that could happen through a, a process of greater empowerment of the people. But this is very, very threatening to an economy that is based on a smooth labor market and translatable, translated in less technical terms, a smooth labor market means that there are wages which are flexible enough, which means that workers are accepting um, a really meager pay for a lot of work to get done. And the risk of a welfare state is that uh, it risks um, showing workers that a lot more is possible if only there is the proper political will. I, I forget the economist's name, so this I probably shouldn't even quote this, but it it, it does I think is an, an interesting point, and I like your reaction to it. And again, I forget the economist's name. Somebody I think was a Marxist came on stage and told a group capitalism is ending, and everyone started applauding. And then he maybe she again I don't even remember who it was. Uh, then followed up saying, "Oh, don't don't cheer. What's coming next will be worse." Yes. So I got I got uh, my um, the capital order. My book was reviewed on the um, Financial Times, and as and it was, uh, no, it was it got one of the best books of the year 2022. So very prestigious. And uh, the reviewer was saying, you know, if you want to read a powerful book about how economics is political, read uh, the capital order. But and then it ends by saying, but the author seems to think that there's any something better than democratic capitalism, which is not stagnation or dictatorship. You know, this is exactly this type of mentality is the austerity mentality, a mentality that tells you that anything outside of the status quo will be worse, if not impossible. And um, unfortunately, I think there is also a generational issue. I think that uh, there is, we are in a moment in which younger generations are fed up uh, with this uh, end of history um, kind of uh, myth in which indeed we can't now not think about anything different simply because we are seeing that we are committing collective suicide. And unfortunately, it's, not co it's collective in the sense that actually the, the weakest in the globe will suffer the, the worst out of this climate catastrophe and this complete inequality crisis we are facing globally. But it's not collective in the sense that it's actually, unfortunately, the decisions of very, very few people who run our capitalist economy who are bringing us uh, towards that uh, collapse. And austerity is part of how we are um, about to face, uh, basically, I think, a collapse and an apocalyptic uh, 
future which is not very distant so i think it is now to tell these people who think that there it's anything that is not capitalist is worse is to tell them well you know what the the direction we're in right now is a direction to complete disaster so either we get more imaginative and especially if we are willing to realize that those in power are not neutral experts but they're there with a political agenda of constantly enriching the few rich powerful ones that we can really um start gaining consciousness mobilizing and asking for a different world and i think this is already happening and uh there is a lot of hope if we keep um building critical antibodies against the mainstream and uh really reading about historical episodes like the one I recount after the First World War in which you see that these post-capitalist experiments were not just abstractions and were not at all dictatorship-like. Actually, the whole point was to gain back economic democracy. Um, unfortunately, the Soviet Union itself had to impose austerity. So the Soviet Union was not an alternative as we are thinking because the Soviet Union was not democratic. Um, but it is the case that the Soviet Union did allow for the West to do a lot of reforms that otherwise probably it wouldn't have done, especially social reforms. This said, I think we don't need to get stuck in the idea that the alternatives are communist China and communist Russia, because we very well know that communist China today is also a state run capitalism and an austerity capitalism in much of it in the sense that the rate of exploitation of workers is extremely high they have been privatizing uh for many years they have entire zones in the countries in which indeed um the worst austerity measures are applied so let's not be fooled about these fake alternatives and let's really think about alternatives and the past is full of them it's just about learning from them and then taking it from here and finally, I do think this comparison to our moment right now to the years following World War I are, are important. I mean, just coming back to the pandemic, uh, and I, 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 I might have my sympathies towards more of a, a social welfare or, or democratic socialism, but I was just really moved by, and again, you said there are crumbs compared to what others uh, got, especially the, the ruling class. But, but the government showed what it could do to start to affect poverty in, in a positive way. And I was hopeful that this was showing everyone, look, government can play an active role and be successful in, in reducing poverty. It didn't eliminate it, but it started to reduce it. And that was more than we have seen in, in quite some time. And, and, and now we're at a moment where all those programs are, are ending or have ended. And, and it seems like, it just feels like to me, the whole lesson was lost. Yeah. And again, um, it, it, they justified as, oh, that was the COVID parenthesis. No, I mean, again, it, it's nothing is a given. This is an, an explicit political decision to um, to once more quell the demands of organized labor in this historical moment and quell demands for higher wages. And if the bargaining power of the workers goes up because the labor market is tight and because um, they have better benefits, uh, of course, uh, wages might go up and this is going to increase the, the cost for employers. And uh, we know that um, corporations are losing if their profit margins go down. So in a world in which, uh, unfortunately, the goal, uh, the, the very reason why things are being produced and sold is profit making, this is the DNA of our economic system then of course this is incompatible with increasing labor costs um so either again we try to think big and we try to think that you know we should pressure government to do more and potentially really to break away with the very logic of a capitalist economy which is again a logic that is all about uh enriching the few and having the majority lose this uh, losers and winners this is uh this is the norm in our society. So we really need to uh, go beyond this and do it in a way that um, I think can speak to people and especially telling them why should we accept that these benefits that were all of a sudden possible during COVID now are all of a sudden impossible. Again, this is a political decisions of the experts in power and we should have a voice in these political decisions. 
Clara Matai has been our guest. He and Clara Matai, assistant professor of economics at the New School for Social Research in New York City. And she has joined us for a conversation about her book. It's called The Capital Order, How Economists Invented Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism. Clara Matai, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you for taking time to join us today. Thank you so much.